On this channel, I talk a lot about famous monarchies from world history. I talk about emperors, kings, queens, etc. But today I'm going to talk about the crowns themselves, as in the physical objects that are worn on the head of a monarch. I did a video on this topic previously, but I didn't really go into the details and history of each crown. So that's what I'm going to do in this video. For the sake of time, I've limited myself to 10 famous European crowns. If you're interested in me doing a similar video for other parts of the world, let me know in the comments. So I've chosen 10 crowns, most of which still exist today, and I tried to get at least one crown from every major region of Europe. I'm going to go through them in reverse chronological order, meaning that I'll be looking at the most recently created crown first and the oldest crown last. So let's begin. The first crown we're going to look at is one you might recognize. This is the Imperial State Crown of the United Kingdom, and it's the one that the Queen wears on special occasions, such as when she gives her speech at the opening of Parliament. However, the first thing you need to know about this crown is that it is not the official coronation crown, nor is it the crown you see on British heraldry. The UK actually has two major crowns. There is St. Edward's crown, which is only ever used for coronations. That's the one you see on the coat of arms of the UK, as well as on several other coats of arms, such as Canada's. But it's actually the UK's second major crown, the Imperial State crown, that you see more often. So that's the one I'm going to talk about. Whereas the coronation crown weighs about five pounds, this one weighs about half that amount. It comes in at 2.3 pounds, so a bit easier to wear on the head. But just because it's lighter, that doesn't mean it's any less fancy. Whereas St. Edward's crown has 444 gemstones on it, the Imperial State crown has over six times that amount. In total, it is covered in 2,868 diamonds, 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds, and hundreds of pearls. So how much is it worth? Well, no one has been able to put a precise figure on it, but the estimates I've seen put it somewhere around 2 billion US dollars. But interestingly, much of that value comes from a single stone this huge 317 carat diamond in the front, known as the Cullinan II. This diamond is sometimes confused with the Kohinoor diamond, but it's actually a totally different stone. The Kohinoor diamond is actually on the crown previously used by Queen Elizabeth's mother. But this diamond, the one on the Imperial State crown, was cut from the largest gem quality diamond ever found which is called the Cullinan Diamond. It was found in 1905 in South Africa and was then cut into nine main stones. The largest, the Cullinan I, is set in the scepter used by the British monarch. The second largest, as I already mentioned, is the one on the Imperial State Crown. Cullinans three and four are part of a brooch, sometimes worn by the queen, and the remaining stones have all been made into various other pieces of jewelry used by the queen as well. You'll notice that I've dated this crown to 1838. Obviously, the British monarchy is much older than that. The thing is, the various crowns used by the British monarchs over the centuries have been made and remade many times. So the current one only goes back to the time of Queen Victoria but it does have some components that are much older. Most importantly, it contains the St. Edward's Sapphire, which is located at the top and is said to have been in the coronation ring of King Edward the Confessor, one of the last Anglo-Saxon kings before the Norman Conquest. Also, directly above the Cullinan diamond is the Black Prince's Ruby, which, ironically, is not a ruby. 
It's actually a spinel, but it's the largest uncut spinel in the world. It dates back to 1367 and is named after Edward the Black Prince, son of King Edward III. You'll notice that it has a little hole in it, in which has been placed another stone. I've heard that the reason for this is that at some point, a hole was drilled into the larger stone so that a feather could be placed in it. Finally, you'll notice that I said that this crown goes back to 1838, but I also said that the Cullinan diamond wasn't found until 1905. So what gives? Well, originally a stone called the Stuart Sapphire was located on the front, where the Cullinan II now sits. The Stuart Sapphire was owned by James II and then ended up in the possession of the various Stuart claimants to the throne after the House of Hanover took over. But in 1807, King George III purchased the stone and thus it ended up back in the crown jewels. Kind of a symbolic move. It's actually still on the crown, but it's been moved around to the back. Okay, the next crown we're going to look at is the Corona Tumular from Spain. And straight away, you've probably noticed the word Corona, one of the most talked about words this year. Well, take note that Corona is simply the Latin word for crown. Coronaviruses get their name from the fact that they have these little bits sticking out that kind of look like a crown. Here, the phrase Corona Tumular simply means burial crown. And this is because this crown was made for the funeral of Elizabeth Farnese, wife of the first Bourbon King of Spain, Philip V. You'll notice that this crown is very different from all the other crowns that we are going to look at, in that it's extremely simple. It has various heraldry around the bottom, but there are no gemstones on it, and it's not even made of solid gold. It's actually just gold-plated silver. This is because in Spain, there is a long tradition of simply proclaiming kings instead of actually crowning them. For instance, you will never see a photo of the current king, Felipe VI, wearing this crown. On the day that he became king, it was sitting there near him as a symbol, but it never once was put on his head. It just goes to show that different countries understand the idea of monarchy in different ways and have different customs surrounding it. The next crown, the Imperial Crown of Russia, is quite the opposite to the Spanish one. What you see here is a replica, but the real one does still exist, even though the Russian Empire, of course, no longer exists. If you're ever in Moscow, you can go see it at the Kremlin Armory Museum. This crown was made in 1762 for the coronation of Catherine the Great. Previous to this, most of the Russian czars, such as Peter the Great, were crowned with Monomach's cap, a much older crown which may have had Mongol origins. It too still exists and can also be seen at the Kremlin Armory. Back to the newer crown though. It is made out of a whopping 4,936 diamonds, and at the top is a red spinel, thought to be the second largest spinel in the world, the largest being the Black Prince's Ruby, which we saw earlier. Now, one of the most notable things about this crown is that it has what's called a mitre shape, a shape usually associated with bishops and which consists of two flaps joined together at the bottom. This differs from the typical European crown shape, which usually consists of a bottom hoop topped with several half arches that join together in the middle, like the first two that we looked at. But Russia was not the only country to have a crown like this. The former Empire of Austria had a mitre-shaped crown as well. The next several crowns we're going to look at all have the more typical shape. This one is the crown of Eric XIV, and it is, to this day, the official crown of Sweden. But nowadays, like in Spain, it is not actually ever placed on the head of the monarch, even on Coronation Day. It has, however, been in use since 1561, when it was made, of course, for King Eric XIV. This makes it the oldest of the various Scandinavian crowns. 
Denmark actually has two main crowns that date to 1596 and 1671, and Norway's crown dates to 1818. I'll use the Swedish crown as an example to point out another feature common to most European crowns, the globus cruciger, also known as the orb and cross. The cross, of course, is a symbol for Jesus, and the orb, as you can probably guess, represents the earth. So taken together, the pair symbolizes Jesus' authority over the world, which is then given to the king or queen. It is very common in medieval and early modern paintings to see a king or queen holding an orb and cross in their hand or wearing it on their crown. Next up is the crown of St. Wenceslas from the now defunct Kingdom of Bohemia in what is today the Czech Republic. This crown goes all the way back to 1346 and is named after the 10th century Czech monarch Duke Wenceslaus I, about whom the Christmas Carol, Good King Wenceslaus, is written. You'll notice that this crown looks somewhat clumsy compared to modern standards, but this is just a testimony to its age. Nowadays, precious stones are always faceted, meaning that they are cut in such a way so that the light bounces around inside of them and makes them sparkle. These stones were polished, but are basically still in their raw state. But look how huge they are. In total, there are 45 red stones, although only one is an actual ruby, the others are all spinels, and there are 30 emeralds, those are the green ones, and 19 sapphires. Sapphires are usually blue. There's an interesting legend about this crown that says that anyone who places it on their head without being the rightful monarch will die within a year. Supposedly, one of the Nazi leaders who governed Bohemia during World War II secretly crowned himself, and because of this, ended up being assassinated the following year. This crown is also interesting because although it still exists, very few people know its exact location. It is locked in a secret vault within the St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague, and seven different people have seven different keys needed to access it. We now come to one of only two crowns on this list that no longer exist. This is a replica of the crown of Boleslaw the Brave, which was the crown of the Kingdom of Poland. It dates to around the same time period as the Bohemian crown we just looked at. But unfortunately, when Poland was partitioned in 1795, the crown was taken by the Prussians and melted down. But since for many centuries this crown was one of the oldest and most important physical crowns in Europe, I decided to include it on the list. You can see it in many paintings of Polish kings. I'll also take this opportunity to point out a feature that is found on almost all European crowns, the fleur de lis. This symbol is thought to have originated with the Franks, who were the first to build an empire in Western Europe after the fall of Rome. And to this day, they are generally associated with France. However, most other European countries use them as well, as a more general symbol of royalty. And in fact, it has also found its way to other parts of the globe as well. For example, Tonga, an independent island kingdom in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which was never colonized by France, chose to put the fleur-de-lis on its crown. Okay, here is a crown that looks very different from all the other crowns we have looked at so far. That's because, although it's the crown of Hungary, it was likely made in Constantinople, and is certainly of a very typical Byzantine style. One of the features that stands out are the hanging pendants called pendilia. These are very common on Byzantine crowns and can be seen in most depictions of Byzantine emperors. In fact, there is a depiction of a Byzantine emperor on the Holy Crown of Hungary itself. On the back, there is an image of Emperor Michael VII, but there's also an image of a Hungarian king. 
To the right of the emperor is King Geza I. The reason these two monarchs appear on the crown is that the crown was made under the direction of the Byzantine emperor Michael VII and then presented to the Hungarian king Geza I. This all occurred around the year 1075. Originally, the crown was only comprised of the bottom circle, which is known as the Greek crown. The arches, known as the Latin crown, were added later, during the reign of Bella III. In total, there are 19 images on the crown, all made from enamel. In addition to the two monarchs already mentioned, also depicted is Jesus, as well as several important saints. But perhaps the feature that stands out the most on this crown is the crooked cross on the top. According to one story, the cross was knocked crooked when the crown was closed in a heavy iron box, and it's been crooked ever since. Nowadays, the crown sits in the Hungarian Parliament Building, where it is on permanent display. All right, we now come to the crown which for many centuries was the most important crown in Europe, the Imperial Crown of the Holy Roman Empire. The Imperial Crown likely goes all the way back to the person who is generally considered to be the first true Holy Roman Emperor, Otto the Great. He was crowned in the year 962, and it's amazing that well over a thousand years later, this very historic crown still exists, even though the empire does not. It is currently located in Vienna, where it is housed in the residence of the President of Austria. But for many centuries, this was the crown that was likely used whenever the German king was crowned by the Pope and declared to be emperor. This was the custom all the way from Otto the Great to Charles V. After Charles V, the Pope no longer actually crowned the emperor, but instead the imperial crown was considered to be obtained immediately whenever a new German king was quote-unquote elected. The imperial crown is unique in that it has an octagon shape rather than a typical circle shape. This is because it is made up of eight flat plates hinged together. Four of these plates have enamel images. Depicted are King David, King Solomon, King Hezekiah, and, of course, Jesus. There's also a huge cross on the front of the crown and a single arch that runs from the front to the back. You'll notice that the overall color is a very deep yellow, almost orange in appearance. This is because it's made of 22 karat gold, which is almost pure, unlike the 14 karat gold common in Western jewelry today. Like the Bohemian crown, none of the stones are faceted. They are, however, quite large. There are 144 in total, including sapphires, emeralds, and amethysts. But one of these stones is not an original. Here in the front, where there is now a heart-shaped sapphire, there used to be a stone called the Orphan, and it used to be one of the most notable features of the crown due to its uniqueness and beauty. It is thought that it might have been a really large opal. Opals are known for their really interesting light play. They can often look as if they are shining on their own. When exactly the stone disappeared and why, we don't know, but it's definitely no longer there. Okay, here is another crown that sadly no longer exists. If it did, it would definitely be one of the most important artifacts from European history. This one was called the Crown of Charlemagne, but please note that although it was in fact older than the Imperial Crown of the Holy Roman Empire, it was not actually the crown that was placed on the head of Charlemagne. It was likely created for his grandson, Charles the Bald, in 875. At least the four plates forming the bottom hoop were. The fleur de lis were added a few centuries later. But this was the crown that was used to crown most of the kings of France 
up until the French Revolution. At that point, the crown of Charlemagne, along with many other French crowns and items that were part of the royal regalia, were stolen in the chaos of the revolution. And it's likely that at that time they were taken apart and melted down, never to be seen of again. The only pre-revolution French crown that survived was a crown made for Louis XV. Of course, Napoleon was crowned emperor of the French after the revolution, so his crown still exists to this day. This brings us to the final crown on our list today, and the oldest European crown that still exists, the Iron Crown of Lombardy. It's impossible to get an exact date for when this crown was made, but it is thought to date to around the year 628 CE, although it could be even older. Either way, this brings us fairly close to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. By 628, much of Italy was ruled by a former barbarian tribe known as the Lombards. It was the Lombards who were then defeated by Charlemagne, who then ended up being the first person to be crowned emperor in the West since the fall of Rome. In addition to being king of the Franks and emperor of the Franks, Charlemagne was also the king of Italy. Therefore, this crown is actually the true crown of Charlemagne. It's the only crown that still exists that would have been placed on his head. So, let me tell you a little more about it. First of all, the name is based on a legend which states that the inner band that holds the crown together was made from one of the nails from the cross of Jesus. That nail was supposedly made of iron. However, testing has shown that the inner band is actually made of silver and that no part of the crown is actually iron. You can see that the crown is made of six panels held together with hinges. Each panel is made of 85% gold and is overlaid with both enamel designs and gemstones. In total, there are 22 gems, seven blue sapphires, seven red garnets, four purple amethysts, and four green stones made simply from glass. Notice that unlike most later crowns, there are no arches or top piece. It's simply a circle. And in fact, it's a pretty small circle, having a diameter of around 48 centimeters. This means that it would not actually fit on an average person's head. If you're ever in Milan, Italy, you can go see this very old and very important crown. It's located in the nearby city of Monza at the Monza Cathedral. Okay, so that was a look at some of the most famous crowns from Europe. If you're interested in jewelry, and in particular vintage or antique jewelry, I'd like to point out that my wife Charlotte actually has her own YouTube channel now that focuses on this very topic. And I'll leave a link to one of her videos on the screen right now. Thanks for watching.